So I'm just going to briefly go over the other types of spark gap coils. There are two other types of spark gap coils that I know of. There's the static gap, which I showed you, which is which just creates a situation where the, the spark jumps across uh, two and you know two two electrodes. In my case, I was using these nice little brass balls, which look cool, very retro looking. You know, kind of uh, kind of looks like uh, uh, you know the old uh, Chrysler building and that Art Deco stuff. Uh, the other two types of, uh, of static gap coils are with rotary spark gaps. Now, the thing about uh, a Tesla coil, about the static gap coils, is, is it turns out when the arc jumps across, the circuit is complete. The next most important thing to happen is the arc has to quench, the arc has to go out. Because if the arc stayed connected, the, the uh, electricity, the resonance would cause the current in the circuit to increase without bound, something would blow up. Uh, in addition, you'd stop having that interesting coupling. A lot of bad things would happen. So you want to be able to quench the, 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 the fire once it's started. Now, as it turns out, what will happen is with a spark gap coil, uh, once you get to a certain point, electricity will increase, and then you'll, you'll pass a resonant point. The, the, uh, um, the, the, the current will decrease, the spark will extinguish itself. What some people do is they'll take a hair dryer uh, or a, uh, a fan, some kind of fan, and they'll blow air across that spark gap. And that actually causes it to quench faster. And that's actually a good idea because you want, it, you want the, the arc to form and break quickly. And so it's like, it's like striking the bell. Instead of striking the bell and holding the hammer on it, you're striking the bell and letting go. And uh, that's not exactly what's happening, but it's good enough for this conversation. So you want to, uh, the next, you know, you want to be able to quench that fire uh, effectively and adequately. So the, um, you know, the way you can do it with a fan blown across the uh, the gap, um, there are a number of different uh, techniques you can look online and see people do it. The other thing you can do is create a rotary spark gap like this. So what do we have here? Uh, we've got motor. I've got <coughs> the motor spins uh, a tungsten rod. This tungsten rod is just in a little piece of uh, uh, ultra high density uh, polyethylene and it's held on there by these two little, there we go, two little washers. Right. Now as it turns out this motor is a synchronous motor got this motor online, this motor is synchronous, which means that I live in the United States. Home power that comes across uh, in a U.S. outlet is 60 hertz. This thing spins at an even multiple of 60 hertz. In this case, it is 3600 RPM. Excuse me, 1800 RPM. So this will spin at 1800 RPM. No matter what you do, it's going to spin at 1800 RPM. There's some interesting benefits you can have. So well, well the idea is that we have electrodes placed all around the periphery of the radius of the motion of this device. Half of these electrodes are going to be connected to one side of high voltage and the other half, you see that, are going to be connected. The opposite side is going to be connected to the other side of high voltage. So you might have, actually if you look in the back, you can see that I've welded on some copper. So all of these are connected to one side of the high voltage and all of these on this side are connected to the other side of high voltage. So what happens is, if this thing spins, if this was set up correctly, and I've got these little, uh, these little aluminum posts that I turned on my lathe, and I've got these uh, little copper connectors, and then a tungsten, bits of tungsten rods. So as this thing turns, what will happen is the gap will narrow between this one and this one, if I adjusted it right. And because the gap is so small, the arc would jump across and the circuit would complete. But this thing is spinning at 1800 RPM, so it's rapidly going to do that. And as it moves, as it moves, the arc's going to break. And then it's going to connect with the next one. And then it's going to connect with the next one. Now, of what use is that? The interesting thing is that because line current in the U.S. is 60 hertz, and because this is running at an even multiple of 60 hertz, I can actually tune, and there's a clever way to do this, I won't get into it, but I can actually tune 
the spinning of this rotor so that it hits, it makes the connections at peaks of the incoming current. So the incoming current is going to be up, down, up, down, incoming voltage rather is going to be up, down, up, down 60 times per second. I can tune this so that it, it connects at the peaks and what that does is it guarantees a higher energy transfer. Uh, now, so again, you can imagine this thing would be spinning. It's connected to a, uh, I don't know, in my case, it's a neon sign transformer, which is outputting 15,000 volts at 60 hertz. This guy is spinning, and it's making and breaking arcs. Um, and you can connect any multiples. So in this case, I may only, I can, you can say I can have four connections if I want. If I had four connections, one, two, three, four, uh, at 1800 RPM, I'd have 1800 times 4 beats per second. That's kind of high. Um, so what I might do is I might uh, only connect two of these, in which case I'd have, uh, it'd only connect, uh, let's see, it'd connect uh, once every rotation or twice every rotation. And that'll give me less beats per second. But the, but the main thing is I could tune it to the peaks of the incoming voltage. This is called, uh, spark gap like this, is called a synchronous rotary spark gap, SRSG. So if you Google SRSG, you'll see synchronous rotary spark gaps, and they are able to create uh, uh, high voltage, high, volt high current conditions to make the, the arcs bigger in your Tesla coil. Why would you do something like this to make bigger arcs? It's all about making bigger arcs in a Tesla coil. So this is one thing you can do um, with a uh, so-called SR. Uh, synchronous, synchronous because it uses a synchronous motor, SRSG. So um, after, after the static gaps, people went to these synchronous gaps. Then the next thing they did is said, put this down. And then we'll get this guy. So the next thing that they said was, well, wait a minute. Why does it have to be synchronous? What if we use a motor spinning at an arbitrary speed and we tune it? We tune the speed itself. Uh, couldn't we generate a more interesting effect? And you can. So what we got, what I have here, is a treadmill motor. This came off of a treadmill from a gym. It's a uh, 90 volt, two horsepower treadmill motor. And what it's doing is it's turning this wheel. And what I've done with the wheel, this is a Garolite G10 wheel. It's uh, impervious to electricity and it's very heat resistant. And what I've got in there are at uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, at eight intervals. I've got each a um, tungsten rod in the wheel. And then the tungsten rod will alternately make and break its connection through th these guys here which are connected on these posts. So the high voltage goes across here. This thing will be spinning, alternately making and breaking uh, the connection which will give you a spark gap that you can control. And what you do is you vary the speed of this motor and by varying the speed of the motor you can change the, the length of the of the arcs, you can tune it just right so that the speed is going where you have maximum energy transfer. Um, but it has one other interesting effect, and that is if you've ever seen a spark gap coil run with one of these and you see the guy changing the speed, you'll notice the sound is different. You can make you can make sounds. You can actually make the the sound of the uh, the lightning arcs, and they are pretty loud, and they can make low noises or high noises. So the lightning arc is like a a vibrating instrument and you can actually make the sound lower and higher and lower and higher you can make siren type sounds and things and people playing around with this realize that there was some there's some potential here the potential is that if you could vary the making and breaking of the arc according to some more logical program or, or some frequencies that made sense to humans like let's say you could make and break the arc uh, at 440 Hertz well, then the lightning bolt would make an A note. It would be the musical A, and so on and so forth. And so because the ARSGs uh, came out, ARA, asynchronous rotary spark gaps, people realized that there was a, there was a possibility 
to make a continuously modulatable uh, lightning bolt and uh, and they did that and in fact what they did was they threw away the whole spark gap technology they started using solid state devices and they started modulating the solid state devices with computers and suddenly you've got uh, an effect like arc attack where you can make music with these lightning bolts. So I haven't spent any time at all talking about how I get power to the large Tesla coils. Uh, these guys over here. I do not use a neon sign transformer for those. Generally what happens is the, the progression of coiling mania. You start with your spark gap coils. You keep uh, adding more neon sign transformers in parallel. Uh, doubling the current or adding 60, 30 or 60 milliamps at a clip. Sparks get bigger and bigger but they stop at a certain point and then you realize you need more current. Um, then you move perhaps from 120 volt supply to a 240 volt supply. Uh, some people use pole pigs that are the, um, the type of transformers that you see on a, a telephone pole. And I have a pole pig and in fact I've used a pole pig before. Uh, the problem therein is that you need um, pole pig does not have any current limiting on it so it views the Tesla coil as basically a short circuit so you need to find a way to uh, uh, throttle the current you use various chokes and I've done that in the past uh, what I settled on for my DR coils is this device here so what we have quite simply is I mean and this is a bunch of things I hacked together um, uh, with pieces that I had laying around so what you see here is uh, let's see this is a uh, um, 220 plug I used to, in my garage supply. Uh, my garage power supply is 2 220, runs my mill and my lathes. Uh, going into a circuit box, and there are probably more uh, more elegant ways than using a house breaker box, but that's what it is. It's a 30 amp breaker uh, for 220. If I'm pulling more than 30 amps, I need it to stop. Uh, and then and you can see why I have two. Uh, uh, volt and amp meters and this thing is capable of running two coils at once and um, what you do is there's a main cutoff whenever you're doing coiling you should always have a master cutoff switch um, I have some secondary fuses back here uh, to protect some of the other circuits and uh, I'll head down here and what we see is the 220 comes in to two separate variacs uh, these variacs actually are electrically controlled, so I can uh, bring them, uh, wind them up or wind them down with these uh, toggle switches here. And um, there's also a 12-volt uh, supply here that uh, supplies the, uh, the power to, well, these are DR coils, so there's a module uh, that, that actually generates the pulses that run uh, the coils themselves and so this provides the power for that uh, there's a current measuring device back there that tells me um, uh, lets me know how much uh, actually that's you know the uh, the power just goes through the center of that thing and that's how I measure the current um, and then way in the back there uh, back here there's a, a contactor uh, that is the master contactor uh, if you hit the emergency supply, the contactor will open and you won't have, uh, it'll stop all the current from the system as a whole. So this is just something I ginned up quickly. Obviously it's made of wood. Um, let's see, we go back here. So um, these are the connectors. I got these industrial connectors. and actually waterproof, which this box is not. Um, this is for the main power for each of two Tesla coils uh, to run the uh, inverters that uh, actually drive the coil arcs and these are two um, uh, let's see there's there's I think 120 volts and 12 volts coming out of here uh, to drive the uh, controllers inside the Tesla coils themselves so that's just a quick rundown of the power supply uh, for the coils and uh, we will um, We'll show you more of that when we get into building the coils themselves. Uh, I should mention these bad boys here. Obviously these things haven't been used in quite a while. There's a little bit, of, a little bit of mold on this. That's how long it's been that I've run these coils. These are interrupters. And let's see, well, I guess the 9-volt battery in them still works. The uh, purpose of an interrupter, it's only used for a DR coil, uh, a solid-state coil. This generates the pulses 
uh, that fire the coil itself and it's let's see actually seeing as how this is a camera you may be able to see if we look in there nah it's too much light um, this sends in um, infrared uh, light pulses down a fiber optic cable I run uh, the coils with a fiber optic cable uh, to generate the pulses that are that modulate the coils themselves. No, this one, this one, the power is a little, a little bright. Let's see if we can see. Can we see any? Not really. Can't really see. Anyway, if we could have seen the infrared, seeing as how this is a, some of these cameras can pick up infrared, and this is sending an uh, infrared pulses. Um, down this uh, through an LED here down the fiber line which is what controls the uh, uh, the modulation of the coil itself all right uh, more about this later so in the words of Al Pacino say hello to my little friend this is uh, my larger Tesla coil um, this is another DR Tesla coil uh, DR meaning dual resonant solid state Tesla coil um, I'm not going to take this one apart uh, I will, in a separate video, show you all the pieces and how they relate. But just to let you see, now that you've, you know, we've explained uh, how the individual pieces work, uh, let's zoom in here. So, so here's the primary. Primary is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight turns of quarter-inch refrigeration tubing. This is a strike ring, which is 3 h inch refrigeration tubing. The uh, base that the coil is on is made from uh, ultra high density polyethylene um, that I machined. Um, the coil itself, the secondary itself, is about 1,000 turns of uh, 20 gauge, uh, 20 gauge magnet wire on a on a uh, on a 12 inch diameter on a 12 inch diameter uh, PVC plenum. The top load is not on this one. Top load is uh, 48 inches by, uh, by uh, 12 inches. So it's a large, a large device that I made. It doesn't fit in my garage actually. Um, so in any case, um, I'll get into all this and take them apart. But I just wanted to show you the, the theory. Just want to give you the theory behind all of this. I'm, I'm not going to explain all this again. And I, uh, I hope it's useful. I'm very welcome, um, very happy, rather, to explain in any more detail anything that I've just said. I believe everything I said is 100% correct. Um, there are uh, lots of resources out there for you to look at. Again, I would highly recommend uh, 4hv.org, teslauniverse.com, uh, Richie Burnett's website, uh, and many, many others. Uh, there's a lot of really good information out there. Okay, so next video, I'm going to start dismantling my, uh, my small DR coil, and uh, I'm going to start building a new, I'm going to start by building a new, new box for it to rest on. Then I'm going to redo the power supply system, then I'm going to um, might, uh, reduce, uh, redo the whole MIDI interrupter system, uh, still working on that, and, uh, and at the end we'll demonstrate them and show you how they make lightning that makes, that makes music. Okay, anyway, my name is Joe. Uh, feel free to drop me a line, and I'm happy to talk to you about it.